Now, there are four theoretical frameworks to the social movement theory, of which there are two that we want to, that we were using as specific focus areas, and that's resource mobilization and the political opportunity. And they're very they're quite clear in terms of what they are. Resource mobilization focuses on how resources, human, financial, and otherwise, are mobilized in pursuit of a collective goal. And political opportunity talks about the necessity of the right context, the right timing, the right set of circumstances to capitalize on doing something of impact. Looking at those two theoretical approaches, you see that both are very much interrelated in terms of informing how we can understand and unpack the summit. So, 10 years of development. I will be very frank, colleagues. There's a hyperlink here to a whole other website I'm gonna go through, Eric. I hope it works. If it doesn't, you may have to intervene. Let's see where we go. Um, so it's showing on my side. You can help me show that sign. Cool. Perfect. So what this is, is a digital chronology that sort of captures 10 years of the development of the education sector. If everyone looks inside their very lovely packs, they've got a very long piece of paper that captures the same thing. For the purpose of this, I'm gonna run through it, and because everyone has a copy of this, I'll just hit on some critical moments. The story begins in 2013. At that time, Gramstown, or Makanda then referred to as Gramstown, was the 10th worst performing district in the NSC results of the country. Uh, incidentally, the other nine worst performing were all from the Eastern Cape. Uh, so it was really a very bad time for, for the province as a whole. But what it does is well, there was a very big wake up call for local stakeholders in trying to identify ways of everyone pooling into and helping to respond to this crisis. And it can be marked as the beginning point of a series of interventions, some very deliberate, others um, very supportive that would help shape the development of the sector. The following year, through the support of Gutter Education, uh, a local school principals forum was put together. And what is this is a structure of local public school principals in the city to help develop a community of practice and get them to have a shared environment and space as peers. This will become a very important point of engagement with the school leadership across the city. 2015, Vestas Empowerment Trust provides seed funding to set up a consortium of multiple stakeholders led by Gadra Education. Um, and this one is really looking at developing, um, yeah, a consortium led by Gadra Education, including the Labonia Center, the South African Numeracy Chair, and the primary and early child education faculty in the department and faculty of education at Rose University. Some of the initiatives that came out of this and two of the key ones is over the period of time they developed an Isikosa spelling B. That's the first of its kind in the country. And they have also then developed what's called a whistle stop school, which is a targeted literacy intervention that's focused on improving reading skills. In the same year, Professor Sizo Mbizela was inaugurated at Rhodes University. Now, this might seem like a weird thing to include in the timeline, but it's actually very important. In his inauguration address and in identifying his key priority focus areas, Professor Mabizela made it very explicit that one of his focus areas would be contribution of the university to the wider city, positioning roads as being of and for the city as a whole, and not something that happens to Makanda, and supporting the development of the education sector. This meant that the university was directly shifting itself to be responsive to the current context and became a very critical enabler for many subsequent programs and initiatives to follow. One of which that was formed is called the Vice Chancellor's Education Initiative, which is a multi-stakeholder grouping um, of education experts in the city that sought to oversee and manage the various interventions uh, uh, that are led by Rose University and its partner in institutions. Um, one of its first initiatives, too, and ones that have been quite powerful, I'll mention two right now. First is a certificate in school leadership, which is a leadership capacity development program run with the Rhodes Business School for school leaders. That's principals, vice principals, heads of departments. And the second one, was the Nine Tenths Mentoring Program, which includes a, a, a structured mentoring program between a Rhodes University student leader and a, uh, a matric student mentee. I'm touching on these because they become quite relevant as we go later on in the presentation. I'm gonna hurry through the next few periods. Uh, so that's what I just spoke to right now. 
uh, a bridging program was set up in 2017 between Gadra Education and Rhodes University to enable local disadvantaged students to have access into the institution. Uh, later on that, the Whistles Top School that I spoke to was then uh, piloted in the same year. 2018, the first time ever, the fee-exempt public schools of the city achieved 100% bachelor passes. 100, 100 bachelor passes for the first time. And this was the first indications, uh, I'd like to imagine it, of, of the green shoots of the positive development that was happening through these various interventions that have been mentioned and others, of course, that happened. 2019, a program run through Roos called Budding Q was redesigned where it aimed to now focus particularly on building pre-literacy skills of grade R children in a structured play-based manner. Um, and this was, again, to enhance the, their development at that age. Then we go to 2019 again. Uh, the organization that I work for, the Circle of Unity, was formed. And what it is, in a nutshell, is a multi-stakeholder structure that seeks to foster collaborative projects for positive impact in the city of Makanda. Then, we know what happened in 2020. COVID came, and it has it, it completely decimated many sectors and parts of the country. And the same time in the city, Makanda emerged as the best performing city in the province as a whole um, and retained that status for a period of time. I'm nearing the end, colleagues, so please allow me. Um, then in 2021, which I think is probably a, a source of great pride for Di and her team, that nine tenths mentoring program was a recipient of the McJanet Prize for Global Citizenship which recognizes these exemplary um, engagement programs um, across the world. Uh, Rhodes, and I think Bruce is still the only South African and African university, if I'm correct, today, to have received this acknowledgement. And what it does is that it's an affirmation of the propensity and potential of this program to enable systemic change. And that's part of what we're talking to. Then over the next few years, we see continued development, but there's a very clear trajectory going forward. The Vice Chancellor's Committee commits uh, resources towards investing in the early child development center, uh, a sector. Makanda in, in, increases its matric passes. So in 2022 and 2023, they received over 300 bachelor passes. And, and it's, again, it's this continued pattern of development and growth in the city. And this then brings us to the year when we started putting together the edu edu actual education summit. Eric, if you could help me go back to the presentation. Still got five minutes, I'll use them very effectively. Perfect. Thank you very much. So, in 2023, decision is made. We're putting together this education summit. It's prompted by engagements with the Vice Chancellor, Gadda Education, and key stakeholders. And the idea is we're at the right moment and opportunity now to bring everyone together to shape what the future looks like. The process of putting it together had to be consultative in nature. So a multi-stakeholder planning committee is put together that met regularly. Sectoral subcommittees are put together, one on ECDs, one on primary schools, one on secondary schools, to do SWOT analyses and situational analyses of what's happening in those specific sectors. And these became very important spaces to mobilize support and buy-in from the various stakeholders of those sectors because it created avenues for them to help shape what are the priority discussions at the summit itself. When the summit took place, it was the beginning of this year, over 350 stakeholders were present, and we were able to have concentrated discussions per sectors that look towards developing key priorities going forward. But at the end of it, there was a, a bold vision that was identified and shared and adopted by the stakeholders, and it reads, by 2028, Makanda emerges as the leading academic educational center and city in South Africa and is recognized as such, thereby affording all local children and young people the benefit of good quality and relevant education at preschool, primary, secondary, and tertiary levels. Now, this is not a vision that can be enabled by any one entity working by itself to push it. It is fundamentally premised on the collaboration and co-creation of the existing stakeholder network in the city. It was the existence of the summit the engagements that happened there that enabled us to get to this point. Now, some key lessons that emerged there to share with you as I round up. First of all, the summit could only work because of the various coordinating structures there. A multi-stakeholder planning committee, 
the Vice Chancellor's Initiative, including educational experts. The Circle of Unity Education Cluster, which has educational activists in the city forming part of a community of, of practice. The school principals forums, where we were able to mobilize support from the principals themselves. The existence and contribution of those structures became critical enablers into what was a successful event to mark out a city-wide vision going forward. A strong sector laid a solid foundation. I mean, if we had tried to do this 10 years ago, it couldn't have worked the same way. You needed the sector to develop to where it was in order to hold the space for what it was. Importantly, all parts of the city's education sector came together and formed part of participating meaningfully in the summit discussions. From your quintile one fee-exempt schools to your quintile five schools and your private or, or, or IEB schools in the city, every single school was represented. And importantly, it was a very powerful moment to show that despite the disparities between the schools, there is commitment to the shared sector that we have. Lastly, the leadership that was at the heart of the summit has to be recognized. The deliberate intent of the vice chancellor to prioritize and position Rose University as being responsive to this was a very important part of this journey. The presence of school leaders and their commitment to forming part of the narrative was a very important part of this journey. Because, and as I've tried to highlight, it could only happen when it happened. It could only be held and extract what it did and, and provide the outcomes that it did because of the journey it went through the moment it landed in. And I think that's my time. So thank you very much. Dr. Westway and I will happily take any questions. It's actually not a question. It's more to add some history to this project to keep it in line with trying to understand the past, present, and future possibilities and the relationship between community, university, and society. Prior to 2013, Saki, just to give you a bit of history, that the whole process of building a relationship with the community was a challenging one. So this actual project, uh, uh, the, 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 the thinking of the project started around 2008. And building that relationship with the community because of the the separation of university and, and community took a number of years for it to reach the stage in 2013 where collaboration was possible and where partnerships were possible. So that part is a history that um, unfortunately I think I've been involved with and so has Dai in the development of relationship with the schools, with the school's principals, and with the Directorate of Education in Makanda. So I'm just adding this to show that building community university partnerships is a very, very difficult and challenging process. It was in the earlier years, and it will be good, it's actually good to see how it has changed in the recent years, and there's more kind of uh, uh, participation and collaboration between the university and the community. Oh, thank you. Second question on that side then. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, Sake, could you speak a bit more to that last point on it happened because it happened when it happened? Um, because I have a sense that that has got a lot to do with the context and the environment. Um, and I'd like to hear more of your thoughts on that, please. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, there's one. And then, Saki, you can respond. Um, the mic is on its way to you. Keep it short, eh? because we only got about four minutes um, for Saki then to respond. Thanks, Saki, for the presentation. Um, at the start, you mentioned that it was a reflection point as well as a strategy session. So have you got any key insights for us, maybe in terms of what was, what came out in terms of the future, and the strategy? Thanks. Thanks, I mean, those are very, very valuable inputs and I'm actually gonna invite Dr. Westway if you could come share some thoughts to those before I jump in. But uh, Dr. Maestri, I mean, I think what you're touching on is so important about the history of the development. It does go before 2013. Um, it probably goes as far back even 2008 and before that because of the nature of the city as a whole. And it's very important to flag that, and, and I hope it was clear, but 
what, what I'm doing right now, what we're trying to capture is a story of so many individual persons in the context of the city. Um, and some of them aren't even fully captured. We hoped that through the summit we'd be able to start identifying some success stories that we hadn't seen or rendered explicit and efforts, of course, to help contribute to the narrative. So it's always helpful to get insights about moments where we don't have that sort of uh, information captured. Dr. Restaway? Um, I think in terms of um, the, 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 final, the final question, Basically, how the summit ran is there was there was reflect. It was a two-day summit, a Saturday Sunday summit. Um, the the Saturday morning was reflection. So there were a series of presentations from the sectors um, that reflected what Saka was referring to, namely the SWOT analyses and situation analyses. That so the sectors in preparation for the summit had basically done analysis in terms of where we are now what we've achieved and why we've achieved it, and that was presented. And then basically from the Saturday afternoon went into, into strategizing and, and planning. So Sake presented the overall vision, the plenary vision, but then each of the sectors, that's ECD, primary and secondary, had developed sectoral objectives and priorities, which, are, which is basically now the focus of ongoing work. So, yeah, it was a very, it was a very kind of um, systematic... Um, inclusive process with um, we were amazed for example by how well uh, early childhood development sites were represented we were expecting a drop-off in participation on the Sunday being the second day but there was it was incredible the commitment of, um, of, of the stakeholders and just the 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 the, the earlier uh, question to comment on that I think so, what, what we try to do in the presentation is is through the chronology is, is to show the build-up of the process, that, that it, was, it was what had preceded, and Margie's taken it even further back, it was what it had preceded um, January this year that enabled the summit, summit to take place. And I think two of the big breakthroughs last year in the planning process were bringing all of the coordination forums together. So Sake mentioned the principles forums, um, the circle of unity, and the vice chancellors initiative. So, these big coordinating structures kind of brought together and yeah, seeing the value in, 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 in one another and basically kind of planning together and in the same light, the private schools, the public schools coming together, I think that was a bit of a first for us. We'd been kind of looking to, to make that breakthrough but what enabled it was the summit. So I think yeah, those, were the, those were the specific things that, 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 that enabled the summit to be successful.